Hello, Devlin Bishop here with you, and welcome to Devlin's Pirate Radio Show. And I am a little giddy right now, because I always get giddy when I get a co-host with me, uh, especially when uh, I have a really cute one with me. Uh, and I do today, uh, a very beautiful man. Uh, I actually met this man when he was a university student, and he was a rambunctious little pup, and I have seen him just grow up into just an incredible man. Uh, we're going to talk to him. There's lots I could say about him, but I'm going to let him tell us all about it. And I am here with Josh Obermeyer. Hi, Devlin. Thank you for having me. And that's a delightful introduction. <laughs> very, very honest, very true. I love it. <laughs> What do you mean, I'm very so, honest? Very, I'm not, so no, humble. No modesty, yes. I could have said so much more about you, but I, I'd be gushing, and I wouldn't want to do that. Now, it's we've known each other for how long? Going on about four to five years now? Four, that's got to be more. We met in January 2011. Yeah. So, about four years now? Four years now? Really? Four and a half years? That's yeah. it? Yeah. It's felt like longer, but it's only been I, four years. <laughs> Of course, when you mean felt like longer, you mean in a good because way. In a good we, way. yeah, okay. felt like, oh, like forever. Uh, God. I've known him for only four years. God, it's just burning. No, no, it feels like we've known each other for longer than that time. Now I know a lot about you, but I'm sure I'm going to learn some new stuff about you here. So let's get to know you a bit. Sure. Were you, um, where are you originally from? I was born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario. Born you, in St. Joe's. So you were born in Hamilton. I was. Very cool. And your siblings? Only child. Only child. Just me. I've met your parents. They're wonderful people. They're 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 interesting. <laughs> they're, <laughs> no, they're they're great. They're great. Yeah. Well, they've raised you really well. Like they're obviously did something right in that. They made me. <laughs> they, yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. You wouldn't be here right now if your mother had no a parents, headache that no night. Parents. Oh. Or your dad pulled out. Okay, let's get back to the interview. So, uh, what were you like as a child, would you say? Being an only child, that's got to be, I know. Uh, I was very imaginative as a child. Uh, I would do little things called stories, where um, what I would do is I would run up and down the stairs while going through stories in my mind and, like, playing myself about furniture. It was just a weird narrative device that I would use. And a lot of people looking at me very strange, but I was enjoying my childhood was spent creating and developing my own stories in my head. That's that's awesome. I I was imaginative too, so I didn't run up and down the stairs. Uh, that just seemed like too much uh, exercise. Um, <laughs> yes, I was husky all my life. Thank you. Uh, well, that explains why you're so uh, in shape, all that running and stuff. And uh, what were you like in high school? Were you popular in school, or uh, I was just an average high school guy. I wasn't uh, wasn't super popular. wasn't a loner. I kind of had a couple friend groups through high school, uh, different ones as my interests changed. Uh, I had a lot of friends who went to the same elementary school, went to high school and university together. So uh, I grew up with with a good group of friends, good people. I wasn't a troublemaker. I was a good student, uh, but I would kind of mutter some comments under my breath every now and then. Now, when I met you, it was through, I was one of your teachers in improv, yes. and uh, you were already in improv when I met you. Did you get to do improv in high school? I did not. Um, I did a little bit for one course in grade 10, but I didn't start doing improv fully until I joined Max Improv Team. Yeah, I, I'm so envious, because I see these young kids that now have improv in high school, and I never had that, and I always just think, you lucky bastards. Yeah, people get to do uh, Canadian improv games and stuff, or have uh, coaches at their high schools, and I'm just like, I, I wish I went to your high school, and I'm hoping that when I become a, a high school teacher or elementary school teacher that I can be one of those coaches for those kids and give them that experience. Well, I'm sure you will, because you, uh, you started doing improv in Mac? Yes. Okay, and what were you going... To Mac or what were you study? I studied history and political science at the master. So no wonder you were doing improv. Yeah, you need something to break up the dryness. <laughs> now, is that something you plan to go into, like uh, what, history, or? history or political science? What, what do you do? I, I'm sorry, I don't want to be. I guess you can be a history teacher, or you're going into politics. Well, what are you doing? Um, no, actually, when I started university, I was a very different person, and I uh, wanted oh. to be a lawyer. 
Oh. Surprisingly. What do, you, what do you mean you were a different person? Like, if I met this Josh, I wouldn't recognize him? He wasn't as fun as I was now. I was very, like, gotta get good grades, gotta do this, gotta do that, gotta do this. Um, uh, when I started university, like, I never, I never drank alcohol, I never really went up to bars and clubs. I was a very, like, good student, a boring student, who's books, books, books. And when did that change? Um, that changed... In the second year, when uh, my long-term girlfriend and I broke up after two years, and I went and then we kind of went off into our own separate things. And, uh, I started spending more time with friends, and starting to kind of accept more invites that I was declining over those two years. And I uh, found the staircase shortly after, too, and got exposed to that new community, and uh, started to kind of getting to know myself, and starting to do things that I wanted to do. What led you to improv? Uh, I was... I was and as everybody is an improv or cruise line is it anyway, that's the classic staple, the benchmark. Most people, um, yeah, I would say I, that's what got yeah. me into it. I actually chose McMaster over Western because of their improv team. Really? So I, it's something yeah. you knew you wanted to get into? It was. It was something that was very important to me, something that uh, I've always wanted to do. And uh, when I was 10 years old, I actually did a cruise line themed birthday party. That made people do improv and that's, all the games and stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's in my blood now. Finally acknowledged it. And you ran Mac University improv for a little while with some yes, people. Yes, uh, I ran it for my final two years. Um, my third year, I ran it on my own, and then uh, in fourth year, I ran it with my good friend Ben. Ben Mallet. Your name now, Ben. You have to listen to this. <laughs> yes. And um, then you made it to the staircase, and obviously the teaching there was just so phenomenal. It was. It. <laughs> it. It inspired me, and uh, it brought out the best in, in myself and in other people in the class, and I thought that uh, that's something I want to do. I want to be able to make people feel the way that these teachers made me feel when I showed up. That's cool, and and that's what we try for. It doesn't always work, but you can always see the people that are ingratiated in it, um, and I remember when I met you, um, and uh, I think you were there with Ben and Steve, and uh, you... Um, I could tell you were you you were just obsessed with improv, and that's for those of you who don't know. If you know you're in the improv bug because the first couple of years you do it, that's all you really want to do. Yeah, you know, like there's other stuff in your life, but you will find a way to improv in it too. And I know you were that way. I was. I I would put off papers and studying to make room for those Monday nights for those hour and a half, and then later three hours uh, of just my weekly dose of creative, wacky fun. <laughs> now, you, you must have been doing improv like every night of the week. You're pretty close. In my third year, I was doing improv five nights a week. Wow. Yeah. Well, was... at least you had two nights to do your homework. Kind of. Uh, did yeah. you actually ever graduate from Mac? I did. I did graduate. Uh, <laughs> I actually graduated without pulling an all-nighter. It was a fun little fact. I actually time managed myself well, despite having crazy workloads and all these other extracurricular commitments. But, uh, it's good four years. Now, you've changed it up a little bit because I, I know you have just started doing stand-up comedy. I have. So what inspired you to do this? Because this is not always the next jump. Uh, some improvers continue with improv or they go into theater. Some go into stand-up. And what was your choice on this? Because I was actually surprised when I started seeing you doing it. Uh, I decided to start doing uh, stand-up and did my first show uh, at Emerson Pub in February of this year, February 2015. Uh, I decided to do uh, stand-up because, different from improv and theater, it was something I could kind of work on on my own for the most part. Uh, and with my busy schedule and schedules of people that I would normally collaborate with, there wasn't a lot of time to rehearse and overlap, despite how often we try to make time. Um, so it became just almost a purely selfish thing that it was something that I wanted to create and the only person I really have to bother or manage for stand-up is myself. Other than that, then it's just getting the shows and meeting other comics. But in terms of the actual material itself, it's it's a very independent, solo-generating thing. And do you find it fulfilling? Like, you've done a couple now, have you? Or, uh... Yeah, I've, I've performed a handful of times, um, and uh, I'm going to perform a couple times in the months to come. Uh, it's... I, I love it. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great way to connect with audiences. Um, you can you can kind of connect with audiences through improv if you're hosting or uh, you get to kind of show them a flavor of yourself. 
the odd time, but in stand-up comedy, it's literally just you in front of the people, and you get a chance to kind of show your way of thinking, and just kind of peel away the little onion layers of an individual in front of the crowd. I, a couple people have always told me I should consider trying stand-up, but I have all the respect in the world for stand-up comics, but I don't believe I could do it. Um, and if I did, it would be pretty much every joke I ever knew, and that was it. I that would be it. I couldn't do it anymore. Um, just because it, I just you're constantly having to make engage with people, make them laugh and stuff. You know. Um, do you? Um, what am I trying to get at? Do you find it's more difficult than improv, or it's just different difficultly? I think it's an interesting animal based on how I've been trained in performance. Um, just because doing improv for so long and then doing some scripted stage productions and then going to stand-up, it made me very comfortable having eyes on me. And the improv really helps get rid of any jam situation. So if a bit isn't going the way it's supposed to or the way it was intended to, you can always kind of alter it based on the mood of the audience. So um, I find that if I decided to go straight into stand-up without any dramatic experience beforehand, it would be a much more challenging experience. Because, uh, uh, little known fact about me, I used to be terrified of public speaking when I was younger. Uh, to the point that I would actually have physical tremors and would start horribly stuttering if I had to speak in front of any group larger than probably two or three people. And if you know Josh like I know Josh, that's unbelievable because this, he's probably mo- one of the most welcoming people. You, you, like, you just, you're there with the hugs, you're, you're not afraid to touch. You're not afraid to be out there, even when you're on stage now. So that's great that you kind of overcame that. Actually, we have that a lot in common because I do have a shyness, and a lot of people are shocked by that. And that's the reason I did improv later in life was to kind of break that shyness out. And I think it worked as I'm talking on a radio <laughs> and revealing all my innermost secrets. It's it's a very important skill because. Uh, Especially in the way that our world is changing now, face-to-face conversations or, you know, like interviews, they're really difficult for a lot of people. Um, see, a lot of my friends and a lot of people that I've met in the last recent years almost pride themselves on their social awkwardness. And it's it's kind of a, a sad thing, but to be able to just sit down and talk to somebody face-to-face about anything and be comfortable talking about anything is a skill that Really, we shouldn't lose, and we're losing slowly but surely. I totally agree on us. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah. Um, we'll get back on that uh, in a bit. Um, you also did improv training in Toronto, if you want to touch on that a bit. Yes, uh, I spent the last year doing um, Second City's Long Form Conservatory and Bad Duck Theater's Narrative Studio Program. Uh, both were really fun, different experiences, uh, very different skill sets required for both. But uh, it was a nice flavor that was different than the usual improv that we had around Hamilton area. Um, which, which is nice to sample different things. And, yeah, a lot of and, inspiration. Yeah, I noticed that, um, uh, well, I think like in anything, the more training you get in different with different teachers and stuff, the better you become. And I noticed that y- you definitely broke out of even more of a shell when you started going there, especially in your teaching. And now teaching has become really important in your life. Yes, very much. Right? Not only have you taught improv. And I don't know about you, but one thing I love about improv is that uh, we do a beginner's boot camp. We both ran it. We both taught it. We still do. Uh, But what I love about it is seeing people coming out of their shells. Even though sometimes you, you see a performer and you know that guy's got it or she's got it. Or even though you see people that you don't think will ever perform, just to see them find that, is that something you enjoy? Because that's what I love. It is one of the greatest feelings when you see that look on somebody's face when they do something that they thought that they couldn't do before. Um, I remember I had that moment so clearly when I was teaching uh, two specific groups. One was a group of nurses a couple of years back, and the second one was a group of uh, local high school kids from Delta. And both groups were kind of like they knew each other, but they hadn't really gotten a chance to to know each other. You understand what I mean? Um, and the, the nurses, they were playing with their supervisor. And like the 
just the dynamic of that relationship changed so fast when you got to see them play. I think um, the role was, I think one of them was a, a butcher, and the other one was a, a Bavarian farmer, and they just did this wild and crazy scene that they would never do in context in a work environment or in their usual relationship, and just to see them explore different parts of themselves and how they can interact in a different way was it was just fantastic. It's phenomenal to see people break out of their shells and to realize that there's something in them that has been there, but they're just, I don't know if it's through society or just through personal scheduling, or just they didn't have the time to tap into it or embrace it. So for those 30 to 40 seconds or two or three minutes of the scene, they get to do that, and that's delightful. It's, it's wonderful just seeing them. I, I am always pushing improv because it is such, it's helped so many people whether you're performing or not. And and usually, like, when we get together, it's always a, a laugh. Like, it, you know, yeah, we should be a little tougher at times, but it's yeah. usually a laugh. Uh, now, teaching is going to be something bigger for you because you are now going to be teaching like, yeah, I in got, the real world. Yeah, so. I got into to Teachers College at Brock, and I'm starting in the fall. And yeah, it's going to be a career type thing. And what are you, what are you going to be teaching? What, <laughs> what children? <laughs> what, what are you <laughs> teaching? I'm going to be teaching beavers how to build dams better in the heart of the cities. I can't find a way to say the word <laughs> children without saying them or its or anything. But you're what? What age group of children are you looking um, to teach? The the program I'm going for would be grades four to ten. Um, my qualifications ideally are going to be between probably grades six to eight. So, yeah. middle adolescent years. Whoa. That's a rough time. It's going to be rough, but it's yeah. going to be fun. No, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I remember that's a, that's the big development. There, that's just before high school, and I remember I was all crying so crazy. It is it is the, the puberty blitz, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's going to be... Pre-puberty. Uh, I, I think yeah. I can handle, you know, kids rubbing up against every piece of furniture you see. <laughs> But it's the pre thing where they're still just trying to figure it out, and you know, yeah, it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be different. You're going to be awesome at it. I I I really do believe that because I've been in your classes, and you just you give so much of yourself to them that they are so lucky to have you. And um. You and I have kind of gone on a journey together because I think you and I have become really close in the last year or two. And, and because of what you said about the whole people don't talk anymore. Because yeah. I think you realize that not only do I like to talk a lot, but I will listen a lot. And uh, I think, um, you know, I think I, I've helped you out of some bad situations. Yes. yes. And, uh, and I know you've been there for me. And uh, I think you're going to have a lot of kids looking up to you. Thank you for that. The kind of words and yeah. the confidence. And well, I we I hope you 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 do find that like because uh, it's a wonderful thing to like just kind of just be there and you know take somebody under their wing and uh, I'm not saying I did that with you but uh, it'd be more sexier <laughs> than that. <laughs> be a nice pillow wing. All right, we only have time for one more question, and uh, you know, do you know how hot you actually are? I I just think I'm an average person. I know. Average, I know. average. Yeah. Anybody who's seen Josh, yes, he's uh, <clears throat> he's yummy. I don't use that for just anyone, but <laughs> I'm just sorry. I I just I'm bad with flirting with my guests. It's what I do. <laughs> Anyhow, we will put you out of your misery now and not ask you any more <laughs> embarrassing questions about your hotness. And we're going to take a small break, and then when we come back, we are going to talk about something we absolutely love, even, well, maybe not as much as improv, but pretty damn close. Oh, yes. Bad movies. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're back. I got a bit of the giggles here. Josh does that to me. <laughs> um, we have a lot in common. We're both hot. We're both love improv, and uh, I found out a little while ago, that Josh is a huge fan of bad movies. Oh, I love bad movies. Love a good, good beef. Then. Yes, and I love that he loved this. And I knew by that point that Josh was an old, old soul. I think you are an old soul because you you would have fit back in the seventies. Oh, the thing, hundred percent. And uh, when I talked to him about 
bad movies, I realized that you were missing a couple of big ones in your yes. repertoire. My my knowledge had some significant <laughs> gaps in it that needed to be filled. And uh, I needed to take him under my wing. Apparently that's our line for the thing. Um, one more of my fat, muscular arm, and I had to take it. <laughs> and I had to show him a couple of movies, and I, I think I still got a couple more I want to show him. Probably like about a million more, but I, I, I have only <laughs> limited time with Josh, so... I have shown him a couple of films that I felt he needed. Like, I think it's a must that if you say you like cult films, you need oh. to see these films. And I agree entirely with the selection that you came up with. So, me. I thought it would be fun to not only reminisce about those three films, but give a younger guy's look at what they are. And the first one I showed you, because... First of all, anybody out there listening right now, if I find out you don't listen to this and I get you to watch this, that means I want to be your friend for a long time. And you cannot go on. No, it's not Xanadu. <laughs> Though I should force Mr. Josh to see that one at some time. Soon, I'm soon. I'm talking about Showgirls. Oh, yes. Elizabeth Berkley, Gina Gershon, Kyle McLaughlin, McLaughlin. and a movie that when it first came out, people clamored to be in this movie. Like, Madonna wanted the script. And it wound up uh, becoming one of the most famous flops in history, but I think it is one of the greatest movies of all time. Like, I, great, as in not just bad, but it's gone past that point of being bad to being awesome. And did you know what you were in for when I showed you this? You had heard the movie, because it's not that yeah, old. I, I had heard of it. I, I kind of heard rumblings, maybe knew a scene or two or a line or two, but other than that, I didn't have any real idea of the true magnitude of what I was getting into with Showgirls. And then, so, when this gay man asked you to come over and watch a movie called Showgirls, uh, were you a little frightened? I, I guess there was, there was a lot of other titles. I was like there that. with two bags of popcorn ready to go, and let's do this. You were, because you should always eat during Showgirls, because, well, <laughs> you know, eat early in Showgirls, because you might not want to eat after. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen it, it's the story of a young girl that goes to Las Vegas to find... Life as a classy, big-name casino dancer. And yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much that's it. Pretty much it. <laughs> Just because they lost the trail on it. What was your first take on Showgirls? Um, was I right about it, first of all? Yes. When, when you sat me down, you said that this is a movie that you could pin every scene as being either the writer's fault, the director's fault, or the actor's fault was completely applicable. Yeah, somebody sent me an article about that that says this movie is so bad that it's fun trying to figure out where it went wrong. Oh, Because on paper it sounds like it's just going to be nice, there's going to be some titties, uh, you know, <laughs> good screenplay. But this wasn't a good screenplay, uh, though I think the dialogue's fantastic. Uh, there there are some great exchanges yeah. over the course of it. But there's also a lot of weird motivations that change, I find, in a lot of the characters. Um, wild emotional swings from the the Versace and Versace yeah. exchange is a huge one of them. Yeah. I just bought this Versace. You mean Versace. And then the next thing later, she chat to somebody else for saying, not saying Versace properties. Yeah. You just, you just 30 seconds ago didn't know yourself, and then it's like, oh, my superiority complex is now kicking in, because I now know Versace. Absolutely. And, you know, you're not really sure if Gina Gershon wants to destroy this girl or fuck her. Yeah. Let's be honest. Like, Because yeah. one yeah. minute she's putting her through the rails and the next minute... They're, they're eating burgers. Yeah. Like, you like tits? You know? Uh, uh, the line, the sultry <laughs> line of, I like, I like nice tits, <laughs> might be one of the greatest iconic moments of that movie. And just that whole exchange of just like, yeah. you're, you're a good girl. I, I like you. I, I love watching it. people's faces when you're watching a oh. small bit of dialogue that's just talking about having tits and yeah, that's yeah, and so and, and that's followed by eating dog food. Uh, yeah, uh, an exchange. So like this movie's all over the place. Yeah. Now, do you think Nomi was bi bipolar in that movie? Like she is just rage. Like even when she dances, you know, she's got this edginess about her, which. Mike loves the scene where she's dancing in the nightclub and everybody's saying she's yes. an awesome dancer and all I'm seeing is flailing aggressively. A, a freaking nut ready to explode. 
It's the dance is only topped by the awkward flopping fish pool sex later. Yeah, oh, the Kyle MacLachlan unsexy. What uh-huh. the hell is she doing? It was like watching his somebody dick. have a seizure. Yeah, and it's supposed to be sexy. Did you? It wasn't sexy. Let's be honest. Let's talk like men. Like Did men? you? Now, if you were watching this on your own, is there anything about Showgirls that you would have thought was erotic? <sighs> Just the dress of the. <laughs> or one yeah. of the characters has a little dress that. Uh... Yeah, you, you got to run out and see this because yeah. there's a lot of inside jokes here. But uh, the fact that you find that erotic is, is Com- very compared to the flailing and the edginess. That might be the most erotic thing in that. Movie. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely something you have to experience. Uh, if you are a would-be bad movie lover, please write down these titles and find them immediately. Yes. Showgirls has been released on DVD probably about seven different times, including one that is a commentary from actual strippers telling <laughs> you what and what not to do. And I can tell you, licking the pole is not something you should do unless they've polished it. <laughs> Which is, I, I say that in real life, too. Unless yeah, they polish it, I'm not licking the pole. Anyhow, um, I then decided I had to go and show him Dark. Now, this next movie was a movie that I I don't show too many people. I think it's a great movie, and I think John Waters knew exactly what he's doing, and I think it fits in today's society. I still think it's shocking to this day. Uh, It was Pink Flamingos. Pink flamingos. Yeah, and I said, I think Josh is ready. I know other people. I show cult films, too. And I will say to Mike, do you think they're ready for pink flamingos? And we don't think they are. And I I just jumped into this as your number two. It just seemed yeah, appropriate to Showgirls to, to the pink flamingos and never <laughs> look back. Yes, for those of you who don't know Pink Flamingos, it's a John Waters early film that stars Divine and his regular bunch, Mink Stoll and lots of others. And basically it's about a woman who is being challenged by this couple for being the filthiest person in the world. Now, it lives up to it. There are some scenes that Josh could not believe he was seeing. They literally have a chicken in a sex yeah. scene where there is a chicken in between two people having sex. And it's a, a real live chicken, and by the end of it, it is not a live chicken. <laughs> yes. Now, were you hoping that was CGI, or were you... Uh, what was your feelings? I'm showing you a movie where a chicken died. I put the popcorn down and <laughs> let let it happen. Um <laughs> You asked me for chicken fingers, if I recall. <laughs> One of those nuggets. No, it was uh, it was an interesting. It, the shock value in Pink Flamingos is incredibly high, and uh, it's it disturbs you, but it disturbs you in a good way. It's not uh, it's not like a, a jackass or something that makes you like want to hurl or vomit or uh, is uncomfortable for the sake of uncomfortability. It's uh, it creates uh, an atmosphere that is designed to make you realize that one person's pain is another person's pleasure. So that's the way I guess they can put it or think about it. Yeah. I always, I told Josh, I like to regale with stories when I show B-movies, so expect, like, a talk afterwards. <laughs> but uh, they did this on a budget. Like, this is almost like a student film. Yeah. And uh, the mother... John Waters' mother actually made them sandwiches, and they actually fried up the chicken because they were so hungry, because oh, they were so sick of sandwiches. And John Waters, to this day, says that that chicken died for art. <laughs> yeah. But they actually ate the chicken. And when I watch this chicken that's been immortalized in the sex scene, um, and a pretty graphic sex scene, I might oh, yes. say. It's, like, it's not a... Does not leave much to the imagination. No, no. Now, um... Without ruining too much, uh, spoilers, if, you can still find this movie. And I don't recommend it to everyone, but honestly, I think if you're saying you were a fan of cult movies, you need to see this. Like, I oh, think yes. there's a ton of John Waters movies you should see. And I'm not even talking about, like, don't get me wrong, Hairspray, Cry Baby, stuff like that is awesome. 
But his really early stuff, like Polyester, the Scratch and Snap movie, mm -hmm. uh, Female Trouble might almost be worse than this. I just think Pink Flamingos works as a movie better. Because he actually nails reality television. He does. Like we, like you said, Jackass is something that became something you watched. And this, people are trying to do things like a Honey Boo Boo and a, all these, like, look at us, we're doing shocking stuff. And yeah. John Waters nailed it back in 1973 when this came out. Yeah, like, uh, you can even trace back shows like Fear Factor or other of those ones where people are put into uncomfortable situations for fame and fortune. But these are people just doing it because they want the notoriety. There's not even money or any financial gain. Like, there is no prize that goes along with being the filthiest person in the movie. At least not that we know of. No, it's just, it's just the, the title. accolades, you yeah. know, yeah, and that's it. And this was a big hit with John Waters. Not huge, but this played in midnight movies. It was one of the first midnight movies, and uh, people, like, rich people would go to this and see it just to say they could see it. They were offended by it, but it was the in thing to say, I saw Pink Flamingos. Yeah. It was the, the cult. It was the, the badge of honor that I'm the one who witnessed this film. And there's so many wonderful scenes in it. Like, you think you've seen asses talking when you see Jim Carrey movie. Josh no. has lived something no. a little more. I will never hear b -b -b -bird, bird, bird, bird is the word, the same way again. Yeah, that most scene. people think of Family Guy yeah. now. Now we but think of Josh, Josh has been ruined for that. And, of course, the most famous scene in this movie is that Divine actually eats shit. Now, yes. when I told you this in the movie, did you think it was going to be, there was going to be a way that it wasn't going to be real? Judging on how the film was shot, 100% that was going to be real. I yeah. didn't think it was going to be any kind of prop or any kind of cheat. Be warned, he saves the best for last, and this yes. literally, you see it coming out of the dog, and Divine actually eating it. right up and goes. And literally, they do it for art's sake. Even John Waters says, I can't believe that you know, I did that. But he also gives Divine a lot of respect because a lot of actresses wouldn't have done it. And uh, for those of you who don't know who Divine is, look them up. We're talking about a three, four hundred pound transvestite uh, and very beautiful in her own own way. Yes, yes. The final movie we will talk about, not as uh, dark as Big Flamingos, no, but, but I don't think note. you knew what you were getting into when you saw this one. No, it was a, it was a what a lovely treat. It was, uh, it was teased at, but uh, I got to enjoy every moment of yeah, it. Yeah, I think after Showgirls and uh, Pink, Flamingos. Pink Flamingos, you thought I was going to show you something, but you actually thought this was quite good. It was a very good film. Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, yes. one of Russ Meyer's awesome films about three go-go dancers that decide they want to just go and kill and steal and race cars. Yep, it's... Uh... It's like Fast and Furious with women, only in 1966. It is, and we were trying to figure out if there was any real good people. I think we found possibly one, not sure about the second, but everybody yeah. else was disturbing in this yeah. movie. Yeah, every character had some kind of vice or twist or warped perspective on reality that didn't quite make them a full hero or somebody you really want to root for. I, I kind of sometimes like watching movies where you're not sure who you're supposed to root for. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of like that psycho mentality when Hitchcock, you know, did it. He, We were following uh, Janet Lee. Yes. And then when she dies, we realize that we have nobody else yeah. to follow but Norman Bates. Yes. Yeah. Where does it go now? And this movie is like, okay, these are the three leads, but I'm not sure I'm voting for them. But you know what? They got cool lines and... Snappy dialogue. Maybe I am voting for them a little bit. Um, one thing I, I remember you saying to me, and I love that you said this to me, is that you, first of all, thought it was a really good movie. Like, the screenplay, the dialogue yeah, like was really, it, like, it snappy. Moved, it was nice. It was good. It would be aw awesome if we talked like that in the real world. Oh, you know, yeah. Just... Some, some of the dialogue is just no nonsense. Just cut to it. It's yeah, Russ Meyer, he was always hit and miss with his films, but this is his granddaddy. Um, but you you also said that you could see this being a template for future oh. movies like definitely Tarantino. Yeah, absolutely. Just the the anarchy of society that it uh, portrayed 
you could see elements of Pulp Fiction in there. You could see elements of uh, a lot of the anarchist films like Clockwork Orange. And you could throw some in there. Um, yeah, it's just it's a very good rendition of that kind of dark culture, that underculture that's out there. That by day somebody can be an accountant, but by night or on their spare time they can be something completely different. Uh, and some people go off the deep end and believe that uh, that pain is a lot of fun for some people. And just because they can do something, in this case, these characters mean they should do it. It's the way that their world works. It's a strange, strange but delightful, uh, delightful romp of those hour and a half. Now, showing you these movies, how do you think they've affected your life? <laughs> Besides the fact that whenever you see them, you'll think of me for just a short minute, <laughs> and I, that would make me proud. Uh, I've I've learned a lot about uh, how not to tell stories. <laughs> Um, whether it be in stand-up or in writing. Uh, but no, I've, I've learned a lot about, uh, just kind of characters in general, I find. Uh, that all these movies, the storylines are all very unique, but the thing that sells them most is their characters. Um, whether it be, like, Divinity and Pink Flamingos, or Cookie, the three go-go dancers from Pastor Pussycat, Kill Kill. Uh, just their own outlooks on life and just their own quirks and stuff. It's it's what makes it stronger. It's just being able to see these characters. Because could you imagine if you drop or merge all three films together? That would be wild that, in uh, some ways. So yeah. You have the showgirl wanting to become divinity, but then being interrupted by the three go-go dancers. I when, you know I never planned it, but I, I realized they are very similar movies. They're all about kind of people who are seeking attention in their own ways. Yeah, it's it's showgirls is she wants to be the star of the stage, if anyone wants to be the star of Phil. The go go dancers just want to be, essentially. They don't want Now you and I have done a lot of improv shows and I've always been proud of you in many things, but I don't know if I was any more prouder than when I actually heard you quoting a Pink Flamingo's line. I'll be shocked if you can remember what you said your favorite line from Big Flamingos was. My favorite line? Yeah. It's probably, I like you more than my own shit. <laughs> <laughs> Could you say that again a little louder? <laughs> I like you more than my own shit. Um, yeah. Great no. line. <laughs> one of my favorites. Yes, that is one of your favorites. I know you also took to the line, don't forget the, the balls, balls mama. Mama. <laughs> Dad, mama. <laughs> Yes, oh, um, yes, and we're not even going to tell you how that fits in the movie, because you're <laughs> going to have to uh, rent it or whatever people do nowadays. I don't know if Netflix has these babies on, but if not, we need to do a bad movie Netflix, yes. where people can just go and, where do I go to see the giant uh, Gila monster and stuff like there that? There it is. So, anyhow, it's great talking to you about that. I love having you here. We it's, are it's a lot of fun. We are fun. so similar. Now, I don't know where the next one will lead us. Ah, uh, yes. But we're going to the dark side, and I've asked Josh to talk about something that we also have in common, but I'm going to leave you with what it might be until after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. And, uh, sorry, that's just the sound of me stretching. <laughs> and, uh, we are back with more Devlin's Pirate Radio, and I got my co-host sitting here, Josh Obermeyer, for those of you know coming that. in late. But really, it's a podcast. How are you yeah. coming in late unless you I, skip you, the first you, two? You can pause and then kind of rewind. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if they paused with the name of this segment. Josh and I are, have a lot in common. But uh, one of the things I noticed that we had in common is that we both have really dirty minds. Very, very dirty minds. Now... Uh, I surprised a woman once, because for those of you who don't know me, uh, and those of you who do, <laughs> I have a filthy mind, and I I will go there sometimes. Uh, if I really know you, I'll go there quite a lot. And I think a lot of people like that. But I surprised a woman once when I actually told her that I only probably reveal about 65% of what I'm thinking. There's a whole world that does not come out, unless I really know the person. Now, sorry, there's a little bit of expose here, but uh, when 
I met Josh. I We were in an improv circle, and this is probably when I wasn't teaching, but somebody would say something dirty, and I noticed that nobody was there. There was like about 16 people in the class, and I got this wicked smile in my head, and I was surprised nobody took it dirty. Then, as I'm looking around the room, there's this cute young bald, blonde, bald, blonde guy. <laughs> I think of you as blonde. I don't know if you're officially blonde, but uh, you'll dirty, be, I'm a dirty blonde. <laughs> you'll be blonde in my in my, my dreams. Um, and basically, I noticed he had a, a a similar smirk on his face. And I decided that I was going to see if this happened. So anytime something really dirty happened, I'd look, and Josh had the wicked smile. And I said, oh my god, I found a, a dirty-minded brother, or I think I think I think I called you my, I think I was your father yes, at my, one my, point. Uh, and my long lost son. And because I'm that kind of person, I actually talked to him about it. And uh, this is a thing. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. This is a thing. Having, having a dirty mind is it's interesting. It's entertaining. Um, I remember... In high school, it was probably like a peak of the dirty mindedness, as it normally is for most adolescents. Yeah. But there would be a uh, get really bored in drama class, and I came up with over a hundred euphemisms for erectile dysfunction. Oh my lord! And strung it together as a uh, an anti Viagra ad. This is the teachers of our future, yes, people. Uh, fellow teacher, this is back in high school, yeah. many many years ago. Uh, yeah, you never thought. I've never thought of it anymore. Yeah. I know. Oh, but I like how that's the first thing that pops into your head. It's it sticks. It sticks with me. It's more like the, the the dirtiest things I've accomplished with my mind. Now, do you remember when I asked you about this? I I remember we were talking I do. online, I do. and I said uh, you have a dirty mind. Were you surprised that I called you out, or did you notice that I might have had one, or wasn't it till I called I, you out? And... I enjoy when dirty minds encourage each other. <laughs> I really sorry. I just can't. That Be sounds so because wrong. Because then it's a, uh, it becomes a bond, yes, but it also becomes a little bit more of a, uh, a competition, so to speak, which is like who can find the dirt and the most innocent of things. Right. Um, now, I there's people out there listening that I know yes. are thinking I have a dirty mind, and I find that there are a lot of people that think they have a dirty mind, but. We go further than that. Like, yeah. like honestly, like, if we did a mind meld, I think we would combust. <laughs> I honestly think we would blow up. If we put, like, I put, grabbed what was in your mind that you don't reveal and what I do, I think it would just be one oh, big ball be, of lust. It would be horrible. Um, <laughs> it, would, it would probably take out two, three cities at least. Minimum. Like, it's... That's the, the dirty mind is just mind. It's just thoughts. There's no act behind the thoughts. Right, right. Um, but it's one of those things where when you have a, a naturally dirty mind, you don't have to think about taking something dirty. Somebody will say something, and instinctively, like muscle memory, like, <laughs> said that thing, or she said that thing, yeah. or it's just, do you really need to use that phrasing? Now, people are saying, like, and I'm not belittling you if you think you have a dirty mind, no. but... But I, I really don't think, like, I, I know people who told me they have dirty minds, and I think they do to an extent. But yeah. then you meet the ones that go a little further. I honestly think I've only met one person who, now when I talk about dirty minds, I'm not talking about, like you said, like yeah. perverted people that go out and do horribly acted no. things. These are just things that you talk about with, you know, people you are close with. and yeah. You know, and you think about it a lot to the point that you think maybe you should be locked up. Because it's just wrong, or am I like revealing way too much about myself? <laughs> but um, do you find it's hard sometimes? Because I find as I get older, it's harder to find people. Even like you find some that can laugh a little bit with you, and then I I drop a joke that's so horrible that they look at me like, "Did you just say that?" Uh, I have a uh, coworker. Uh, I'm not going to name names, um, but uh, this individual has. Probably the dirtiest mind of anybody I've met. That's like beyond like your eyes. Right. Some of the things that will be said are just like really like to the point like even even I get kind of shocked, which is hard to do because I'm usually uh, a very open-minded person. Yeah, very, yeah. Very uh, very hard to shock, 
I think, as I said, I've met one person I worked yeah. with that I think may have a dirtier mind, but I think it's even more twisted, but not in a negative way. No, just uh, like... He's a very nice guy. I yeah. technically want to name him just because I... If he's listening, he would just get a giggle from it, but he probably knows who it is. <laughs> yeah. But um, now, do you get excited when you hear? Because sometimes, like if I'm like in a lunchroom or I'm with a group of people and they're talking about you know movies that they watched or shows they watched or here's a good recipe you should try, and then all of a sudden they talk about like you know oral sex or something. Do you get like kind of excited that the topic is going to turn to this like? I get giddy when I'm like, oh, now, now we're talking about something. Oh, it's when when situations like that pop up, or when you get um, those those rare golden moments, uh, it it gives a, a bond between people because like you're not gonna be one of those people who talks about, oh, I gotta do my taxes, my grocery shopping, just all those little mundane parts of life because we all do those mundane things. And I can talk about it, but yeah. I can't talk about it. I, I'm shocked at how people can go on about oh yeah like taxes or sports or so like well not sports it's a passion type thing. I, I once overheard a conversation when uh when i was working in the restaurant about two people and they talked about the price of apples for almost the entire length of their meal just apples <laughs> just apples like it's an apple you spend money you eat it you put it in a strudel that's oh my maybe god a pot. To carry on an entire dinner conversation with one other person about apples? Wow. Like, I just... I don't want to whip up my dick and say, what do you think of those apples? <laughs> I what wouldn't do, do it. I wouldn't do right. it. In what my dreams, it? I would. I would totally think about it. Now, I... Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you like apples that much. Are you willing to pull a Jason Biggs? Now, when people... Like, when I tell people I have a really dirty mind... And I don't just go around telling people. I usually... No. I get excited when I meet people like, oh, we're going to click. We're going to click. And then there's some people you're like, I don't think I can, you know, and I, I get really grumpy if I don't get to be myself. Yeah. And, and you know, when I'm like at a family event, my, my family can be pretty raunchy, but I don't think they know just how raunchy I could get. But it's probably not something I, 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 I could just whip out. <laughs> whip. <laughs> you love that phrase. You're whipping out everything. Too. No, I'm whipping out everything. I'm. No, I, I'm excited to talk about this, and you know, you know, I'm gonna do some really nice ones in the yeah. next couple of weeks to make up for this bill. No, even like my parents get inklings of the dirty mind every once in a while. Like anytime the word balls is thrown around the house, I'm, yeah. I'm snickering and giggling. Yeah, I know. We, we, I used to work with a guy. I'll name him Ryan. He's a really nice guy, and we've become really good friends. And. He giggles like a schoolgirl when I just go up to him and go balls. And he told me this, and I said, "You just told me something that I can use against you." Because now, and now I've got him. Like he sends me the odd email that just says balls, and I love making him giggle. And it's like you know, I'll even just throw balls in any conversation, even if he doesn't expect it's coming. There is a uh, a story that happened where I was, we're at a party a couple of years back. Uh, this is like a Howard Stern almost esque segment. Good. Um, and uh, we're we're talking with my one friend, and he's like, and the topic of course, like oral sex, popped up, and he's like, yeah, like uh, my friend was with this girl once, and she was crying the entire time. And we're all like, she was crying. I didn't you tell her to stop. He's like, no, like she was convinced she had to finish. And I immediately thought, like, what would a crying blowjob look or sound like? And so I came up with this mime, and it was just like. <laughs> I wish you all could see the oh, visual was... right now. You'd all be offended. I am aroused like <laughs> you wouldn't believe right it's, now. It became an inside joke um, working at the restaurant because every once in a while when it's low or slow, I'll, I'll walk up to the window and you can only see me from like the shoulders up and just start doing that to the line cooks and just seeing what will happen. The best is when it's happening and somebody walks in the kitchen door and just mid thing with no explanation. You just got to finish it and go on. <laughs> Now, this is a personal question, um, but Ooh. do you find... They say that men think about sex every eight seconds. Gay men think about it every four. Do you think about sex a lot, or is it just your dirty mind, or do you... Because I... I'll let you answer first. <laughs> uh, honestly, I actually don't think about it as much. 
It's a, it's a strange thing. Um, it's just a trigger with when you hear something dirty or something. Yeah, it's just a trigger to go there, but I'm just like, oh, i got to hump everything I see. Uh, no, it's... Um, I, being a, a very busy individual, like uh, especially in like, like recent months, too, there just really hasn't been time to be thinking about too much dirty stuff. I like, pause them maybe once an hour, give or take, but it's not... Mm-hmm. Not eight seconds. Well, I think the eight seconds thing is just a ridiculous number and yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's just like... I, I don't think I should have to answer, because this is my show. But no, I I think about it a lot. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. It's just ridiculous. Except I have not thought about it once since you've been here. Because I'm working, and I'm a professional. Okay, a couple we're, times. Yeah, we're couple talking times. about dirty ones. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. couple the, times. The straight face that you're giving yeah. after that did not. Uh, yeah, I... I may have gotten aroused when I saw the chicken scene in Pink Flamingos just a, just a little bit. I'm not that sick. I didn't go out and buy chickens that day. <laughs> um, do you find it's... Um, do you get excited when you meet other people with it? Like, not excited, like aroused, but are you happy that you are going to be able to let your guard down a little bit more? Oh, yeah. It For any kind of um, like team environment, as soon as I find like one or two people that I can tell dirty jokes or dirty jokes with. Yeah. I immediately just like change gears. I'm yeah. I'm in there. I can I can banter with them more. I can make I can try to bring out more of them that way. Yeah. Um, just because this. And there is a lot interest. of people that have like I would say an average dirty mind, which oh, is yeah. enough to go and have a good time and a good laugh with and stuff. Yeah. And, just, until just you drop kind of... that strange one where everybody's like. Luckily, I'm a nice enough guy, so most people like write it off after a bit and think, "Oh no, he's not oh, that no, weird." That there. There's no mention of putting mint jelly on something. And... No, no, it's but uh, yeah. Um, any, have you ever had a really inappropriate time where you thought about sex? Ah, oh, really inappropriate time. Ah. Oh. Maybe we shouldn't mention this. Probably, <laughs> probably had an inappropriate time, but I just haven't. Yeah, you can't. I can't. I can't recall it. No, I. Because it's. Uh... Well, that's okay. We don't want to put you on a, a, a thing. I, I have. I, I know. I've visited hospitals where I've had relatives or friends that are sick, and I saw like doctors or oh. interns that. I'm knowing I shouldn't be fantasizing about having sexual intercourse. Oh God, what am I? Amish? <laughs> sexual intercourse? You're, you're having the coitus. You know, I'm thinking my, I should be sending positive energy to the person who's ill. And I'm thinking about, you know, getting a sponge bath or giving a sponge bath. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's positive energy in its own way. Yeah. Like, I find uh, dark humor comes out at funerals a lot. Oh, yeah. Not sexual, I want to do you on the casket, but just, I think it's nervousness that comes out. And I don't think that's necessarily a dirty mind. I think just people no, are relieved. Yeah, they just want to break the tension. Yeah. Sometimes I think balls. Like a joke. You just, <laughs> balls. You, balls. Balls. You know. Death is balls, okay? It sucks that we all have to, like, that's why I don't write a lot of, like, sermons. Sermons. <laughs> <laughs> Eulogies. I, eulogies. I have done both eulogies for my parents, and they were tasteful. Uh, I actually think my dad, um, I don't know where I get my dirty mind from, but my dad was very open for letting me see stuff like Benny Hill and stuff like that when I was really young. Probably went over my head, but I'm starting to think it might have sunk in earlier. Well, my, my parents were very open about like, life stuff. So, like, they were, I wasn't really super censored. When I was younger, I remember like, seeing Austin Powers from when I was like six years old. Yeah, like, yeah, it's all good stuff. Um, yeah, I I got my uh, my experience when I walked in on my parents. Yeah, we were talking about this, yeah. and I didn't want to bring it up, although I thought um, it'd make a great thing. Oh, yeah. uh, I never had that, and I think this happens to more people than others. Now you told me it was it wasn't just missionary that oh, you walked it was in on. Like, oh, Are you okay to talk about this? You just I just remember walking into a room and there's like candles everywhere, and then just they're going. It's romantic. To, it's romantic. It's going to town, and then going the, into the, town. The the franticness of oh. Our son is in the doorway. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, and then my favorite thing is how they described uh, sexuality to me is that it was when mommies and daddies blow on each other's belly buttons. 
Yeah, and that's what you thought it was. <laughs> that was, uh... Your first girlfriend, admit it. You were blowing on your <laughs> belly button for the longest time because your parents screwed you up for like, oh, I swear this is how it works, no. Um, no, no, it was, uh... Yeah, that was in grade two. That's a sweet story. Yeah. That was I never cool. walked in on my parents. I don't think they were that close that they actually had sex. Um, I did hear a hand job once. <laughs> I did. I heard my... I think it was a hand job. Um, how I know it was a hand job is because I think my mother gives lots of direction, and I just remember when it was done, she was complaining about it all sticky on her hand, and I'm like, please go to sleep. Please go to sleep. So, I remember um, <laughs> living in the, the place I was at before I moved out. Uh, my grandmother lived with us, and I lived in a, a little periodic fear I would fuck it on my grandmother. <laughs> oh my god. Getting, uh, but you know they had to be. Like, uh, all grandparents had to be goers. Oh yeah. Cause I'd like to think so. My, my, my grandma likes to. I swear she's got a more active dating life than I've had. And she's, like, she's been married a couple times. She has a the odd boyfriend here and there. So you know she's. Uh, uh, she's uh, taking, the, <laughs> taking the wood. Uh, there's, a sorry, re- there's a reason sorry. she needs that walker. <laughs> sorry, I'll try not to uh, give your grandma later when you leave. Oh boy, it's a it's an interesting dynamic there. But uh, yeah, she was convinced that one of the delivery guys was hitting on her, and uh, she turns to my mom and goes, "He's cute and all, but you know, we don't date younger men." <laughs> <laughs> Says the seventy-five year old. <laughs> I think at 75, and God help it never happens, but if uh, Mike something happens to, I, I'd date younger. Get, you know? Be, be, uh... At 75, 30 is younger, right? That's kind of... Yeah. <laughs> you can take a whole lot of other things under your wing. <laughs> oh my God, I've lost all track of my thought process here. <laughs> I know, there are weird situations that some people don't worry about that. Um, like, I've actually, I don't even, why am I sharing this? But the other day I was talking to Mike, and I'm surprised Mike's, like, Mike's got a dark sense of humor, but not in my realm. And I remember seeing, like, a heartthrob when I was a younger person, and I thought, oh my god, I thought he was so dreamy. And they have a son now that I think is hot. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm multi-aging multi-generational now like you know they'll have like I, I think like Clint Eastwood and he's got a really hot son Scott Eastwood now and I'm thinking oh my god I'm now moving into the generations but as I get older everything kind of turns me on like anything just anything I, I think it's just like you gotta be comfortable with with sexuality like it's it's such a hot button topic for a lot of people a lot of people are I hate that our society is more comfortable with violence. Yes. Where in, like, Europe, they're more comfortable with sexuality. Sexuality. And, like, violence is more like we should be... But I hate that we're desensitized from violence. Yeah. And now we have generations of kids that you are mentioned sex, and they're almost like, oh, that's unheard of. But you show somebody, like, getting a machete to the forehead, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But we could probably find the dirty aspect of that, too. Give me a machete. (laughs) Anyhow, uh, if you do have a dirty mind, you can contact Josh and uh, Devlin. We are going to have, like, a support group. Actually, we're just going to sit around and talk dirty. Yeah. But we should start a club or something like that for people who think that they might be past the the 65%. That you're allowed to say. The Dirty Debate Club. Well, Josh, I had a great time. You're so me easy too. to talk to. Thank and you for having me. It's we've a done lot of this fun. a million times, but it's nice to have a microphone. Yeah. We'll do it a million more. <laughs> <laughs> Please come back when you get a chance. Whenever and, uh, you can. Tell us your teaching stories. And oh, that there will be stories. There will, there be, will stories. be stories. Well, I had a great time. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you very soon. Cheers.